Hey, good morning. good morning. So I want to talk to you this morning about women drivers real quick, if I can do that. No, not just women drivers. My woman has a driver and really it's not her talking, me talking about her more than she's talking about me uh, driving. We were driving the other day and we've had this conversation a bunch, just Joy and I. Um, she, uh, I don't know if it's a depth perception issue, if it's just a lack of trust, but she's convinced I'm gonna run into the back of the person in front of me every time we go anywhere. It's all be four or five car links back, just like most of you guys, your wife or girlfriend or significant other sitting in the passenger seat and you begin to brake gently in a controlled manner and they freak out. They yell, stop, there's someone in front of you and they're convinced you're going to have a collision. So I've asked Joy, I said, Joy, you've got to stop because you're going to give me a heart attack. Every time you yell, you've got to stop telling me I know that there are people. And the thing is, I'm just going to tell you a secret. And I know that this is true about Lori Shouse. She's probably watching online this morning. And I talked to a couple other guys after church. I think maybe this is a, a thing that maybe is you'll, you'll resonate with. When my wife drives and she comes up to a stop sign or a car in front of her, she does like full speed till the last second and then just locks them up and stops. And it scares me to death, but I never say a word. So now she's listened to me and she's stopped saying anything when I do this, which is really nice because you don't, you know, we're trying to work on our, you know, relationship and, you know, trying to be best friends and all that. So she's not, she doesn't say anything, but this is what she does. When um, she gets scared, which is every time we get in the car, she just sucks all the air right out of the car. <gasps> like that. And so I look over and we were in, in Urbandale, right over by the high V on 86th. And I'm, t I'm three car lengths back. And for some reason she was convinced we were going to, so she, uh, she, and she puts her foot on the brake and she throws her hands back. And then I look over and she did this right that. And that's not even our religion. We don't do that. She was kissing her finger. And I said, listen, you may not be telling me how to drive, but, but come on. And she said, you can tell me not to say or to say anything to you about your driving, but you can't tell me not to get ready to meet Jesus. And so <laughs> she was right about that. Nobody likes to be told what to do, do we? So today I'm gonna be telling you what to do. Uh, you're gonna love that. You're never supposed to start, to start a sermon with a negative, but I'm starting it with a negative. Uh, I'm stepping on your toes as mine have been stepped on. And we are in the third and a half week on our series on the seven deadly sins, seven things to definitely do if you wanna to totally destroy your life. We don't wanna destroy our lives. And so we're not gonna do these things. And today we're gonna to be talking about gluttony. I'm surprised you even came today if you knew we were gonna be talking about that. That's a, that's a subject that is a very invasive subject. It's very personal, but it's not just food. You've probably already been in a city group this morning. You probably have already been through your discussions, so you know where we're heading with this. But we're in our third and a half week. The first week we talked about confession, what it is that you do when you run into one of these things that you know you should make right in your life or we should make right in our lives. The second week we talked about pride, capital P, capital R, capital I, capital D, capital E. And if we had to pass a test after every week to move on to the next week, I would still be on the first week because I'm working on listening and waiting well. And I told you that last week and I'm still working on it this week. My time's not more important than my wife's time or anybody else's time. My ears are not more important. My thoughts, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna be patient. I'm gonna respect. I'm gonna kill that pride because it destroys my relationship with God and with others. Then we talked about last week. Does anybody remember? Don't disappoint me. Does anybody remember what we talked about last week? Envy. Envy. Thank you. Oh man, I was so worried that no one was going to say anything. And um, I guess we would just go to lunch right now. You wouldn't even have learned about gluttony. You wouldn't know what to do when you go to lunch. Envy. Uh, that was a great week also and, and sort of uh, informs the way we live. Now, the list of seven deadly sins is not from Jesus. He did not communicate this list in the, seven, or in the Sermon on the Mount and say, these are the seven things y'all shalt not do. Um, Jesus didn't talk like that. Anyway, it was a list of things that the desert fathers put together back in, you know, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, just seven categories, theological categories, categories of sin uh, that um, were common to everybody. Things to watch out for so as they organized their their preparedness spiritually, they begin to sort of organize them around these themes. Now, the Catholics, Pope Gregory I in 1609, I believe, uh, decided, hey, it's a good idea. Let's make this Catholic. They took it a direction. We certainly don't take it. But I still love to look at these, these, this list because it's a great benchmark for us, the great things for us to think about, to make sure we're not exposed. And I'm sure we are exposed. So we want to shore up those weak spots. Now, pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, and sloth. 
And won't that make us feel good when we cover all, all of those? And then we head into the Thanksgiving and Christmas season. We'll be ready for a little Thanksgiving and a little Christmas after we cover all of these things. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, let's look at this together. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. As we cover a topic each week, please do not elbow your spouse, your partner, your friend, your son, your daughter, your mom, or your dad. Please do not think about who you should be texting to say they should listen to this sermon or this teaching. Ask yourself, is this for me? Because there's something in here for you. The topic today is gluttony. And as we've already said, it's not just about food. So you can relax. It's about a lot of different things, but really let's just define it so we can kind of get going together all on the same page. Do you want to do that? Gluttony. Traditionally, it's a habitual greed or excess in eating or drinking, an overconsumption or an overindulgence. And obviously this is a bad thing. Because when we choose to do this, we limit our usefulness to God, we limit our availability to others, and we limit our longevity and our ability to stick around and deliver the message of the gospel that God's asked us to be about. So it's a significant issue, and it's one that most Christians look the other way about. We will vilify some sins, but look at the other sins um, with tolerance and just sort of, uh, it's just part of life, explain it away, laugh about it even, and it's certainly something we should take seriously. However, my definition, the definition we're going to use today is anything in excess that keeps us from becoming the person, the you that God has planned anything in excess. Now keep in mind, it's not stuff that's obviously sinful. If there's something in your life that's obviously sinful, we are not at all talking about um, whether you should have some of this in your life or not. That has to go. Thoughts, actions, attitudes toward the world around us in our relationship with one another, our disposition toward God. If there's something in us that God points out that shouldn't be there, it has to go. But we're talking about things that in some cases could be okay or could be good, but in excess have become bad. So we've talked about food. Alcohol is one of those things. Is it always bad? Not according to scripture. Can it be bad? Absolutely, it can destroy lives. Your cell phone, social media. Could it be good? Sure. Does it destroy lives and relationships? All the time. How many times have you been to dinner at a restaurant? And of course you haven't done this, but maybe seen somebody do this where you sit down at a table and you look across the restaurant and you see a couple and generally they look like they've been together for a while. They are looking at their phones, not at each other and barely even look up. When the waiter or waitress comes, they'll look up and order and then right back down at their phones, participating in somebody else's life, but not really living the life that, that God's given them. When families get together, how many families are all together in the same room, sometimes not even seeing each other very often, but all their heads are down on their phone, playing games to occupy the mind, looking at other people's lives, being consumed with everything and everyone that's not there, but ignoring the there that's right in front of you. Amazon can be an overindulgence. If you can get a job working from home as an Amazon delivery driver, you probably have a problem with Amazon. Amazon's amazing because we can just sit there in the convenience and comfort of our own home. And anytime there's a lull in conversation, in concentration, we can pick up our phone and we can buy stuff. And if we're not, I mean, if we're careful with what we buy, it can be at your house at four in the morning the next day. Like not even having to wait 24 hours. It's almost immediate gratification and it's amazing, but it will chip away at our resources. Give us an overconsumption of things we really don't need in the first place, cause clutter in our lives and occupy resources that should be allocated other places. But we say, after all, everybody's got to shop on Amazon, sure. But not like we always shop on Amazon. There is an overindulgence, a tendency toward overindulgence that we have. And we do it to ease pain and dis-ease that's in our life a void that should be filled by the presence of the Holy Spirit and our relationship with God. 
So whatever it is, if it's food, if it's drink, if it's social media, if it's Amazon, and the list can go on and on and on and on, we have to kill it. Because if we don't kill it, it will kill us, our relationship with God and our usefulness in discovering God's purpose in our life. Anything in excess that keeps us from being the people God wants us to be. So you can finish this statement. Our city groups have all been working on this statement uh, in their groups earlier today. Now, as I'm speaking over on the other part of our facility and then midweek in our, as our groups meet, finish this statement. If I was going to totally ruin your life, my life, my kids' lives with gluttony, with overconsumption, this is what I would tell you to do. Eat everything you wanna eat. Eat so much that you can't eat anymore. Then go home and not be able to move or think. End up becoming so encumbered that you have health issues, that you put yourself at risk, that you can't be functional for the rest of your life. Buy so much on Amazon that you don't have any margin left over to invest in people's lives, to give to the Lord, to give to causes where there is in fact need. Take up every spare cent and consume it on yourself in trivial things that we don't really need in the first place. Never put the cell phone down so that you never really have a relationship with anybody except people who aren't in the same room with you and don't care in the first place. That's what I would tell people, but yet we do it. We anesthetize our lives and don't really live them in the first place. And so God tells us, I need a living person, a person who's available, a person who's as healthy as they can be, who's as engaged as they can be, who is willing to discover this purpose and to be used by God. The Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians in, uh, chapter 9, verse 27. And the Apostle Paul uses two analogies here, two examples, and he switches them. Now, I don't want you to get confused when he switches them, but what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the time during this first teaching section and then the time after I come back and we finish this up is self-discipline. I'm not gonna be sitting here talking about all the evils of overindulgence. You know if you overindulge, you know if you have a problem, you know if you're anesthetizing some pain or something in your life, if you're trying to fill a void, you know that. If you don't, God will point that out to you. What I wanna talk about is how we can live in victory to be as useful as we can possibly be. But after all, nobody really likes to be told what to do. So let's let God's word inform us. In 1 Corinthians 9, the apostle Paul had just finished a section of scripture where he was talking about self-denial. He had just said, listen, there are a whole bunch of liberties in life that we could have as Christians that we don't really need, but we could fight about what's our right and what's not our right. And I can do what I want and nobody has the right to tell me what to do. And you're not the boss of me. And he works through several different examples. He talks about meat offered to idols. He talks about reaching Gentiles. He talks about reaching Jews. And at the end of the day, he's making a point. He said, self-denial is the, is the way to be useful for Christ. We need to deny ourselves. And the apostle Paul proved over and over again that there's nothing he wouldn't do to reach you and me for Jesus. So he transitions his thought in 1 Corinthians 9. And the thought is transitioned from self-denial to self-control. Now, self-control is something that we lack. Two-year-olds lack it and 52-year-olds lack it. Self-control is one of the most important disciplines or characteristics that a person can have, but it seems like it's one of the most evasive. I've told you a story before about a pastor who really influenced my life. Man, it's gotta be 30 years ago. And his name was Jay Dennis. And I was at his house, I was a youth pastor and he invited me to come to his house. And man, that was a big deal back in the day when the senior pastor invited you over. If you weren't in trouble, it was really, you look forward to it. And so I went over, his wife made us lunch. I had a sandwich, I ate the sandwich. It was great, I don't remember what it was, but I was hanging out with Jay. And then his wife brought out some chocolate cake. And I think this was staged. I think maybe it was like pre-planned. And uh, Jay, the pastor, he was fit. The guy was, you know, he, he, was, he was fine, took care of himself. He said, no, honey, I don't, want the, I don't want the cake. I don't want it. And she looked at me and she's like, you want cake? And I'm like, yeah, I want cake. I'll take his cake if you don't, you know, give me both pieces of cake. And so I'm sitting there eating cake, two pieces. And I said, Jay, why didn't, why didn't you eat the cake? You're, you know, you're fine. You could have it if you want. And he said, Rick, I want to tell you something I've learned in life and I wish I'd learned it earlier. He said, sometimes just because you can doesn't mean you should. Now, did you hear that? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. 
And he said, I could eat the cake and it'd be fine. But he said, I find that if I tell myself no in little things, that when a bigger thing comes along, I'm used to hearing the word no. You've heard me tell this story before. It's one of my favorites. And I listen. So when the really big things come, I have self-control and I can discipline myself. But we don't tell ourselves no by putting down the phone, by pushing back from the buffet, by engaging with the people around us, by saying no to Amazon. I mean, we don't say no to anything. So we say yes to everything and then it becomes big things and we find ourselves living with regret, which we'll talk about in a minute. So Paul writes about this and I wanna cover this very quickly and it's very important. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Now he's talking about the Isthmian games. I have to pronounce, practice saying that, Isthmian. They had the, uh, the Olympics in Athens and then they had the Isthmian games in Corinth. And they were like the Olympics held every three years and people competed, it was a big deal. And they competed for a pine wreath that went over their head, but it wasn't the pine wreath. It's kind of like if a person was to do a race today, you were to do like a race and, and you compete the race, you got done with the race and you got a, a little plastic trophy or maybe a medal to wear around your neck. Uh, those are cheap, right? They cost like six bucks and you got it and it represents something, but it's the fortune, the glory and the fame that you get from, from winning the race that means something. You hang it in your office and nobody comes up and goes, oh, that's such an expensive medal, just a cheap trophy. But what it represents was something so much more important. In the Isthmian games, <laughs> I'm gonna get that right, Isthmian games. Um, I never thought I had a lisp before, but I think I've discovered one. It's a hard word to say. People had to train and provide evidence that they'd trained for 10 months prior to the games. And they, I mean, ate right. They exercised every day. They were disciplined. And um, for the last 30 days before the games, you had to check in at the gym and you had to go live there and somebody watched you and made sure you did all your track workouts. You did all your weight workouts. They watched what you ate. They were evaluating you and you had to be there for 30 days before you even qualified to go into the games. And then when you got to go into the games, you got to compete. And man, when you got to compete, it was a huge deal just to compete. So everybody knew what Paul was talking about as he was writing this. And let's go back and I'll finish reading this to you. He said, don't you know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the little pine wreath crown run in such a way. He's talking to us and our spiritual lives run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in these games goes into strict training, self-control. They do it to get a little pine leaf, fortune and glory that won't last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And then he says, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't just get up in the morning and I'm just tossed back and forth by whim. I don't say yes to every little thing that comes into my life. I'm not controlled by things that some people would argue are good, but in reality are bad in my life. He said, I don't do that. I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight. He switches his examples here. Like if I'm trying to connect with a sports metaphor and I'm talking to you about Iowa State football and you guys aren't really paying attention. So then I go over and talk about Caitlin Clark and the WNBA and you're like, oh yeah, I get it. He switches his examples to get his entire audience involved. So he said, I don't run aimlessly. He said, I don't fight like a boxer who's beating the air. He said, no. My opponent is myself and I punch myself in the face to defeat my body and my mind and to make it useful to God. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I will not be disqualified for the prize. This is a guy who had proven that he would do anything to be useful to God. He'd been imprisoned, he'd been stoned, he'd been beaten, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been hungry, he'd been lonely, he'd been talked about. And he said, whatever it takes, I wanna be present for others and useful for God, which involved saying no to both little things and to big things. And it also involved saying yes of the little things that led him in the direction that he wanted to go that became big things over time. Let's wrap this section up together. So my question, 
What wouldn't you do to become useful to God and to discover your purpose? This is scary. This is a scary question. Because all of us, if we're honest, we have something that'll come to mind. And it sometimes is so much a part of us that we're not 100% sure who we're gonna be if we let it go, if, we, if we're different. And any change is scary. So this question I get is, is a scary question. But what wouldn't you do to become useful to God and to discover your purpose? Most of us, this is the honest truth. Most of us, we don't control our body. Paul says it, the Bible repeats it over and over again. It's evidenced by living life like we live. Most of us don't control our body. Our bodies control most of us. Most of us don't control our minds. Our minds control most of us. So what is it you wouldn't do to be useful to God, present for others, and to discover your purpose? We're gonna come back in just a few minutes and I'm gonna help apply this in a way that I think, I know, could change your life forever. So Joy and I were shopping this last week at Fleet Farm out in Grimes. Anybody ever go to Fleet Farm on purpose? Um, it's a, I mean, it's a great store. If you want anything, you can buy a bag of peanuts. You can get, uh, you know, diff fluid, def fluid for your diesel. I mean, you can buy a tire and you can buy a pair of boots. I mean, it's a store where you can get everything. So Joy and I were walking in and uh, Joy likes to hold my hand. We like to hold hands when we're out, when we're in public, we walk around. Um, I guess like a junior high couple. She knows the rules. She always has to hold my left hand so I can protect and defend with my right. But we walk around holding hands. Now we were holding hands going into Fleet Farm, walking from the car into Fleet Farm. And this old man looked at me and joy. And he goes, ha huh, ha, huh, she's holding your hand, huh? And um, I thought that was a really strange thing to say. So I ignored him thinking he was just some crazy old man, right? And, um, and then he laughed again. He goes, huh, like that. And um, it was really annoying. And we were like at the handicapped parking places by that time. And then he starts laughing, huh, 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 like that, all the way to the doors of Fleet Farm. So I asked him, um, what's so funny? Yeah, I was getting a little frustrated. And he said, oh, she's got to hold your hand to keep you from buying everything in Fleet Farm, huh? And um, she didn't have to hold my hand to keep me from buying everything in Fleet Farm, it turns out. But that's what he was concerned about. We should learn to hold our own hands when we go into Fleet Farm or anywhere else so that nobody else has to give us the self-control to be able to do or not to do the things that are going to help us achieve or, and accomplish our goals. And that's what we're talking about, self-discipline. And the beautiful part is you don't have to do it alone. It seems impossible to discipline all areas of your life. Spiritual discipline, relational discipline, emotional discipline, physical discipline. We've been working on it all year long here at Capital City Church. One thing informs and affects the other, it informs and affects the other, it informs and affects the other, and all of it works together. In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit creates in us some things. If we are being transformed, if we're doing, uh, intentionally doing these things, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In life, we're going to have pain, right? Anybody ever, well, all of us have had pain. Pain is a part of life. But regret, I'll say it again, regret is one of life's greatest pains. And if you've lived any amount of time, you have regret. Now regret, when there's still time to change, can be a phenomenal motivator. But regret, when there's no time left to change, feels like a death sentence. And if we choose discipline or self-control over choosing to regret not choosing discipline or self-control, God promises to help us, to give us the strength that we need to be useful for him, present for others and to accomplish our purpose. That he's with us, behind us, pushing us, in front of us, leading us, beside us, nudging us, that we're not alone. And in Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews sort of reinforces this point with the, the expression or the analogy again of a race. 
in Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews says, listen, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a big cloud of witnesses, who are the witnesses? They're the Old Testament saints that have gone before us. For our purposes, they're the people we've known in our life who maybe have died and gone to heaven. A cloud of witnesses who are already with Jesus not watching us run because it's a misunderstanding. I've taught this to you before, but a misunderstanding that people who've died are in heaven looking down on us, um, watching our lives. It's a way that we comfort ourselves and things we tell ourselves about people who've died. But in reality, heaven is without sadness, disappointment, pain, or suffering. And if my grandma's up there watching me in my life, she's gonna have some disappointment, some sadness, and some suffering. I don't want grandma to have that, neither did Jesus. They aren't watching us. They are with Jesus, which is so much better, but they are waiting for us. So it's like a crowd across the finish line, waiting for us to finish and to run well. And he said, therefore, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. So the sin and the hinder are two different things. What hinders us is something that may not be sinful to us. It may just be a habit in life that we have told ourselves is okay, but in reality isn't okay. And we argue about our liberty and our rights and how it's none of anybody else's business, but they move us to a point where we're mastered by things that we could argue are good, but in reality for us, or toxic. It's the myth of moderation. One of the things that drives me crazy is when people say, well, all things are good in moderation. It's not true. Moderation is mediocrity and never in the world would you ever want to say to God, you know what? I want my relationship with you, God, to be on point. I want it to be moderate. I want to have a, I want to be, you know, in moderation, God, I want to draw close to you. In my marriage with joy, it's like, I want our marriage to be dynamic. But you know what? In moderation, joy, I just, you know, I don't want to go crazy. I mean, I, I have to have moderation in our relationship. You got to give me a chance to, I mean, that would be preposterous, wouldn't it? Physically, it's the exact same thing. We say, well, in moderation, I can eat or drink whatever I want. But if you want to stay the same, maybe, then yeah, it's a lie you tell yourself. But you're constantly living from a deficit. If we go and eat something today that we know is bad for our bodies, then tomorrow we have to go to the gym and work it off. So our biggest goal is to undo the damage we did the day before so that we can call it moderation when in reality, it's just complacency. It's lethargy. So when we set goals spiritually, we discipline ourselves and we're willing to put off things that may be okay for some people in some situations, but for us are not allowing us to be sharp spiritually. So there are things that we do in life, hindrances. Literally, the writer of Hebrews is talking about a weight. It's like having too much weight and trying to run. What do you do? You shed the weight so that you can move faster. The sin is obvious. He says, get rid of the sin that entangles you, like a root that reaches up and grabs your foot if you're running a race. You wanna you know, get, get rid of that. I mean, if you do heroin, for example, I hope you stop. But too, any heroin is too much heroin. It's not like you can do heroin in moderation and be okay. I mean, that, that's okay. If you're a murderer, I hope you stop, but you can't say, you know, I think I'm just gonna choose moderation here in my murder and I'll only kill one person this week instead of two. If there's sin in life that we know, I mean, well, I mean, pornography. It's like, well, I'm in moderation. I mean, I've cut it down to 20 minutes a day. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's bad. We have to eliminate it. And he says, get rid of anything in your life that you know is sinful, but evaluate those things that you argue with yourself about that you say are okay. But in reality, uh-uh, they're not okay. They are sabotaging you. And he said, um, run with perseverance. The word for perseverance is patience through terrible circumstances in life, difficult circumstances, ups and downs, the race that was marked out before you, your race. All of us have different challenges. All of us are born with different genetic, biological predispositions towards certain things. Some people have medical reasons why they'll never be physically fit. Some of us have emotional baggage that keeps us from really being as emotionally or mentally healthy as maybe somebody we compare ourselves to. But God created you on purpose and the things that he's allowed you to go through are not accident. And you can be the best you you can possibly be and run the race that's set out before you, not somebody else's race. We talked last week about if you're trying to run somebody else's race, you're envious about their, their walk with God and God's purpose for their life that you'll never actually achieve anything. 
But the reality is, is that we're not all created equally. We may be created equally as far as our human dignity and created in the image of God, but we have challenges. Four years ago, when I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, the doctor said to me, nothing you could do to have prevented this. We don't know why it happened. This type of cancer, papillary cancer is not genetic. It's not, you know, you didn't get it from grandpa. You're not necessarily gonna give it to your kids. There's really no reason, no explanation. No amount of physical fitness would have helped you not get it. And there's nothing you can do to cure it. We'll just try to, you know, cure it or let you live with it until you die from something else. So, I mean, that's fine. If you have to get something, that's not that bad. So I made a decision at that point, four years ago, almost exactly, that since my body failed me once, that I was gonna do my very best to put myself in a place where I wouldn't allow it to fail me again. But the challenge was, even though I had the motivation, the medicine they used to treat the thyroid cancer made my energy levels go up and down so much that some days I was jumping out of my skin and then some days it was all you could do to even get in the car and drive across the street to the gym. The medicine I took made me crave carbs and I loved carbs anyway. But yet the desire was still to bring my body under submission because I don't want it to fail me if it's my fault. If I have to go through a surgery again, I wanna be able to recover quicker. I wanna be there for my granddaughter. And so it would have been very, very easy for me to say, because it's harder for me than most people, I'm just not gonna do it. Everyone would have understood. My wife would have understood. She'd have been like, yeah, let yourself go. I get it. It's hard for you. But you know, it's hard for some people to even be in church in a crowd because of what you've been through. For some people who are struggling with depression and anxiety, it's hard for you to be in relationship with anybody because of what you've been through. Because of the way you've been wounded by a pastor or by a church in the past, it's really hard for you to trust the spiritual body again and to lean in and to say, I'm gonna begin to grow and this is my family. And my point is this, that we're not all created equally. We all have challenges and we have to decide, are we going to push through those challenges and do whatever it takes to be useful to God? Or are we gonna allow the challenges, the, the trials and circumstances of life to destroy us? And the writer of Hebrews, he says, run your race with perseverance, with hupomone. Don't let the bad times win. You have to overcome. You may never be in better shape, emotionally or healthier. You may never have a relationship that's better than. You may never be spiritually more mature than somebody else. But it doesn't matter because God has created for you a purpose. Custom made, custom tailored. I have two questions that I wanna ask you that can change your life. I hope you're ready for them. You have to choose, you have to decide. I can't make you, if I could, I would. What do you want most in life? What do you want most? Um, and I'm not talking about winning the lottery. I mean, don't be silly, right? I want a magic genie that'll pop out with three wishes. I mean, what do you want? When I'm talking about being mastered by things, about allowing yourself to indulge in excess, about being honest enough to stop talking about what's well, moderation, it's moderation, but really say, you know what? It's keeping me from being on point. I wanna be more like the apostle Paul as he served Jesus. What wouldn't I do? What's the one thing you would deal with? What's the one thing? For some, it would be, I wanna lose weight and get healthy. That's a tremendous goal. We know how to do that. We don't wanna do what it takes, but we know. We know what's required to say no to little things. We know what's required to make healthy choices. We know what's required to pass the plate. We know what's required. We know what's required to go to the gym. We know more calories burned versus the calories consumed ultimately ends it. But we know all that, but we have to choose a great goal. Number two, I wanna have a better and stronger marriage. That's what I want because I feel like my marriage is keeping me from being on point. And I have indulged in shortcuts either with my mind or my activity or I've crammed hobbies into my relationship that squeeze out my, my time and my attention to my wife, whether my eyes have strayed and I've let them stray so much that my heart is not pure toward her or if you're a woman toward your husband, but I want a better marriage. I'm gonna do whatever it takes, no matter what. Here's a thought that I've had over the last, I don't know, three or four months, shared it with Pastor Dan and really nobody else except my wife. It's not that revolutionary, but I'll share it with you anyway. You may disagree, it's perfectly fine. If you're married, um, and you have a spouse who says they're a Christian, who is at least willing to try to have a walk with God, and some of you don't, so it wouldn't apply to you, then I believe that God's view of marriage and when two people become one, 
and become a partnership before the Lord. But I believe what God has been telling me over the last two or three months, so much so that on my to-do list in my phone, which I live by religiously, every night before I go to bed, the last thing I do is check my to-do list. It has this statement on my to-do list. You can't come alone, you have to come together. You can't come alone, you have to come together. And every night I defer it till 9 a.m. the next morning because I figure by nine, I've already blown it and I need to remind myself. What's that mean? It means that I have to take spiritual responsibility for my wife and my relationship. She's, she should be doing the same thing and I believe that she is. But that for me, I wanna do whatever it takes to have the kind of relationship where we finish well together and that I love her and she loves me more in the next 15 years than we have over the, the first 35. And what's that gonna take? Self-discipline self-denial, saying no to some things because I want yes later. And is it hard? Absolutely. I'm the most irritating person in her life most of the time, but yet she perseveres. But I want that far more than I want to be like so many who live in a loveless, hopeless relationship that maybe we could have done something to prevent. Maybe not. I wanna grow closer to God. Oh man, we all said that in January, but sometimes we don't even do the things that we know we should do in the first place. I wanna grow closer to God, but I wanna do it in moderation, God, because if I wasn't doing it in moderation, I would be attending worship, I would be giving sacrificially, I'd be serving in some way with people who can't serve me back. So when we look at our own lives, it's like, what am I willing to do? Well, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to rearrange my schedule. I'm not willing to rearrange my budget. God, are you kidding? I'm not really willing to rearrange my time because, you know, I mean, serving people, that's a little extreme, isn't it? So what we're telling God is, you know, in moderation, I'll love you, but I really don't want the full experience. The things that we know to do to put scripture in our life in some disciplined and regular basis, to listen to a sermon, to listen to a song, to make prayer a part somewhere in the course of your week. We know the things to do. It's not a mystery. We choose not to do them. But with God ready to be behind us, pushing alongside, nudging, in front, leading, developing this self-discipline in our life so that we can be useful to him, present with others and to discover our purpose, why wouldn't we do it? So what is it that you want most? We are the sum total of the choices we have made. Many explanations, but no excuses. I own everything that I've done in my life and the bad stuff is my fault. And I can give you tons of explanations as to why it happened. But at the end of the day, it's me. I was the one, I made the choices, so did you. We are the sum total of the choices we have made. Bad circumstances, good circumstances, bad results, good results. We are responsible for the choices and we can change by choosing to make different choices, not rocket science, this is just life 101. So my second and final question is this. What are you gonna choose to do now to get it tomorrow? or do you just wanna stay the same? What are you willing to choose now with God's help to begin a new journey, a new step in spite of the obstacles you have in your life, genetic, environmental, circumstantial, we all have them. To be present with others, to accomplish God's purpose, to be the person God intended in the first place. Because if you, if we choose not to do something now, it will likely become one of your life's biggest regrets. And it'll be too late. Now, what's the good news? We're doing it together. We started in January as a church family and we said, we are gonna be different, we are gonna change. One discipline affects another, which affects another. Our personal lives, our finances, our relationships, our emotional health, our spiritual health, all grow synergistically because it's what God does. He gives us the power to do that. All we have to do is lean in. Whether you've joined our journey last week, last month, as you continue with us together, hand in hand, this is the kind of stuff that we're developing. And it's not so that we can be excellent people. It's so that we can be Christ-like because you matter and God made you for a reason. 
And if you woke up today and you have breath in your lungs, he's got a point and a purpose. And I want more than anything else to help you find that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent together. And I pray that my friends will listen to whatever it is you're trying to, to say. I've said a lot of words today and all of them just seem to fall short in my mind to how important it is to drive this point home. But, but you're God and I'm not. Man, I'm thankful for that, especially in times like this. Your Holy Spirit has been working. You've been talking to my friends as you've been talking to me all week. And I pray, Father, that today is the day that we resolve to change, that we ask for your help because we do not have the strength. We failed before, we have failed on our own and we'll fail again. But with your help, we can't fail to live like the Apostle Paul, who in Romans says he can't do the things he wants to and the things he wants to, he keeps on doing. But yet even in his own life, developed to the point where he said that he runs this, this race of faith with purpose, the author of Hebrews, shedding off those things that, that hinder us, that weigh us down, getting rid of the sin that trips us up. This freedom that we're talking about, this peace, this joy, this sense of purpose. What you offer us, Father, is ours if we're willing to reach out. So that's my prayer. And I pray it for myself, for my family, for my church family. And I pray it with confidence. Most of all, I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.